Okay, sure. Life's a race. But since when is it about coming first? It's not about her. Or him. Or... Yeah. This is about you. You're at the starting line. See, this is your race. Let's go. Improve yourself. Challenge yourself. Nice work. Enjoy yourself. Always wanted to try that. Push yourself. Test yourself. Free yourself. yourself. Well, that is crazy. Race yourself. She gets it. In 2014, South Korea is one of the most important coffee consumer countries on earth. With more than 30,000 shops, each Korean adult drinks around 338 cups of coffee by year. With 50 million people, imagine how many cups are used every year. How can we improve the life of Pepka? Reuse the entire cup seems impossible. But what about its sleeve? We focus our reflection on new interactions between consumer and the product. For what? To increase the relationship between them and change consumer use. That's why we created an augmented reality application using the paper cup as a platform game. The coffee sleeve became a game coverage when it's scanned.
the augmented cup by creating emotional link improve the life of the packaging. The game offers a new experience between the brand and the consumer. This funny moment will boost the brand image and make it unavoidable. Hello, my name is Fabio Governale from Bosch Sensotec and I am the project leader of the BNO55. The BNO55 is a new sensor in a new family of application specific sensor nodes which can calculate inside the absolute orientation from 3-axis accelerometer, a 3-axis gyroscope and a 3-axis magnetometer and the absolute orientation is given in form of quaternions or um, Euler angles. What we are launching here at the Atmel booth is also the brand new Atmel wing board which has our BNO55 on board and also the new Arduino board, the new BNO55 on board. And now my colleague Divya will introduce you to our target market and applications. The BNO55 sensor what we have here uh, is developed especially for target market uh, like wearables, uh, Internet of Things, indoor navigation, robotics and for applications such as context awareness. And as we all know there are lots of products coming every year into the market. Uh, for these specific applications, the key for success to all of our customers is getting the right product at the right time. By integrating sensors on the sensor fusion in a single device, the BNO55 eases the integration process for customers, freeing them from complexities of multi-vendor solutions. So they spend more time on product innovation. The demo we have in here with the Atmel wing board is pretty intuitive. Where, you, where we use the quaternion outputs from our intelligent sensor fusion software to animate the shark. It gives an idea to our customer how they could integrate our sensor for the applications. Thanks to Atmel for inviting us here to the booth and thanks for watching. Well, first of all, who are you guys? I'm Tim Twardall. Yeah. Mike Gifford. Yeah. And, and Laurie Mall. 
Yeah. And where are we? Right. We're at Wim Labs headquarters in Los Altos, California. Yeah. And I have one of your watches. So. Excellent. So what do you guys do other than watches and what, what does this watch we, do? Well, we actually do a lot more than watches. We've made a, essentially a wearable computing platform that can be embedded into all sorts of different things. Watches are, are real natural because it's a sort of glanceable experience of getting just the data you need when you need it. But we have examples of, you know, putting it into a bike handlebar mount. You can pop the module in here. Or uh, something that might attach to your computer to keep you updated even when the lid is closed. Uh, or here's another one that, that can hold the module that's sort of a carabiner clip that you could wear on your belt or on a pendant um, and keep that sort of glanceable data always accessible. Yeah. Cool. So what what can you do with this platform right? and why did you guys build it? You want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah, I would love to. So um, if you go back to when we kind of got started as a startup company, our... our How long ago was that? Uh, two and a half? Two and a half. Yeah, the, the CEO and founder Dave Mooring started thinking about this on an on a extended sabbatical and he really kind of got hooked into this idea about wearable computing and started looking at wearable and where wearable had been and where it's going to go and what you might be able to do with it and what the handicaps were. And, and what came out of that is a couple of things. There was a convergence of technology, processor speeds, and Dave actually spent a, a decade at Intel um, and at Rambus. And so he's looking at processor speeds are getting faster and faster and, and energy and power is going, coming down and, and energy density of batteries was improving and there was this convergence of technologies that looked like it was right for wearable. And wearable had been kind of floundering for a better part of 20 years. Everybody talks about it. If you're in a design school somewhere, you talk about wearable computing and, yep. and what might you be able to do. And Even and, at Google, they're talking about it. I did, at CES, Sergey Brin came up to a friend of mine who's wearing a, a, a Motorola helmet cam, and mm -hmm. they started talking about wearable stuff. Yep, yep. Well, and, and you know, so when we started thinking about it and looking at it, we didn't come at it from the, the device and the wrist necessarily. We came at it from, let's take the convergence of technologies, let's go build a platform. Let's build a device, let's build the services. Services they get easier and easier to put in place. Let's go build applications. Let's look at an operating system that's scalable. And, and back to that convergence of things, if you look at Android and, and iApps, if it unleashed this creativity, the likes of which we haven't seen in a long time. You look at the amount of apps that are being created today, it's because there's a platform there. So they didn't... People don't have to go out today and build a computer. Same thing on the wearable side. What we realized in looking at the data, and you look at academia and into the professional world, wearable kind of got stuck because people didn't have a computer. They couldn't go build a computer. They didn't have something small enough and, and sized right. They didn't have, they built embedded systems. And the problem with embedded systems, of course, is you can't iterate quickly enough and you can't get to multiple uses and things. And therefore, the kind of the wearable stuff stalled. And the more we looked at it, the more we realized there's a gap here in building the device, and then there's the opportunity to leverage Android and this wonderful, wonderful creative world of, of applications. So we set out to do that. We set out to build a solution, which is the device. It's the services. It's an application store and ecosystem. And then the next trick for us was, gee, do we build a branded thing for ourselves, or do we license it to others, and do we go do enabling types kind of things? Yeah. And if you look at some of the people who are emerging in this space, uh, Digital Companion is pretty obvious. You want to talk to your cellular phone, you can get caller ID and SMS, and there's a variety of things that you can do. And I think, you know, it's going to evolve. You see a lot of traction there. It's exciting, but for us, we really want to look at how can our solution move and migrate well beyond that simple companion with your phone into kind of other key areas. Yeah, well, we, we've seen this stuff before, too. Fossil, the big watch company, exactly. mm -hmm. has shown me wearable prototypes for two or three years now. Well, oh, they've, they've essentially exited, right? Yeah, they yeah. sold that off to somebody yeah. else because yeah. they didn't feel like they could sell them in quantity, right? right? right. I, I don't know if it was quantity as much as it wasn't sort of core to their business and yeah. their know-how. Yeah. Um, it's, it's definitely a, a different skill set and a different sort of retail channel probably and a different margin structure. Yeah. So it may not be what they're comfortable with. Yeah, Fossil makes, uh, I don't know, 10 different brands of watches right. and they sell them at Macy's and stuff like that and they, yeah. and they sell a lot of them, you yeah, know, millions of them, not just... Uh, you guys can make a profit probably selling 100,000 watches, right? You yeah, although we're going to sell a lot more than that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Confidence. I love it. <laughs> now, how do you, so there's so many, there's, I, I've seen the fossil ones. Yeah. And how do you, what do you guys differ? What, well, what's different about a wind watch? To Giff's point um, about some of the things you can do with this, they've all focused on that cell phone companion space. So um, almost universally, those products are nothing without the phone. So if you look at, 
the I'm Watch, the Impulse, who I think you guys have talked to, uh, the Meta Watch, which is the X Fossil thing. Uh, they're and, and actually they've been described by people who make those as sort of dumb terminals for the phone. And we're really a separate standalone platform. We play really nice with the phone, but we're not dependent on the phone. Yeah. So if the phone goes away, we still function, and that allows you to do something like make a runner's watch uh, or something that, that in a scenario where you don't want to be carrying a phone with you. Yeah. Tell me about the watch. First of all, how much does it cost? So we're selling a developer kit today for $199, okay. and uh, it's available on our site and also on Amazon. And it really is allowing our third-party developers, and, and we opened this program up a little over two months ago, and we've got 33, 3,400 registered developers so far. It allows those developers to start to play with the system and build applications and understand what it's like, not just on the emulator on their PC screen, but on, the, on their body, on their wrist, or however they choose to wear it, so they can really get a sense of how to create compelling micro apps. Right. And that, that's actually something I think is worth talking about a little bit, are these micro apps. It's different. And, we call them micro apps to, to sort of set that bit with people that they shouldn't think about them like a traditional mobile app. It, it's about data consumption. It's about getting what you need at a glance. Um, it's not about long sessions and deep interactions. It's about you know looking at it for a few seconds, but maybe scores or hundreds of times a day. Yeah. Give me a sense of some of the apps that you have on your watch and, and what what can a developer do with them. So we've we've shipped I don't know just a half dozen things on our uh, on our modules that go out. And they've been sort of focused on a couple areas. Time-based stuff because a watch is a natural use case, so timer, stopwatch, alarm clock kinds of things. Uh, we focused on pulling data feeds down from the internet to show people you can bring down your Google or Exchange calendar. Um, you can bring down weather feeds. Um, we've seen third parties do stock and RSS feeds and things like that. Um, and we focused on some of these mobile phone interactions that we talked about. Now, what's the, so first of all, there's a Wi-Fi module in here, right? Yeah, it's Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and GPS. And we open those up to developers to, to create applications around. So to, to just sort of keep going on the apps for a second, yeah. what we're about to do is open up our micro app store. And that's a place where developers can start to market their apps and allow third party, or, or allow consumers to download the apps and install them. And so we're seeing companies like Astra Tasks, who has a very popular task manager on Android today, building a mini version here. And we talked to John Paris over there. He's all about productivity and how you maximize your productivity during the day. And if he can have a watch face, as we call them, that, that lets you see what do I need to be doing next or what are the three most important things for me to accomplish today, that's perfect for his customer segment. And so we look at a lot of things like that, what's doing well on Android that, that makes sense to bring into this micro app environment. Um, I mentioned the, the stocks, uh, you know, being able to get feeds down from various things. The RSS thing has proven to be quite popular. I think there are two use cases there, actually. There's reading on the device, which has been enabled today, which is okay, but it, you know you don't want to read a long time on a small screen yeah. like this. But back to those phone interactions, if I see a story I like, I touch it, and it launches the browser on my phone, and by the time the phone's out of my pocket and I've swiped to unlock it, there's the story waiting for me, right? Yeah. And we're doing a lot more stuff like that. There's a company uh, that's got an app called Tasker, is that right? Mm -hmm. That's built a, a very cool app for us that allows you to really control your Android phone. So they can launch different applications, they can launch URLs in the browser, they can generate something that will not only launch the camera application, but trigger the shutter. So you're really controlling a lot of things from, from the Win module, which is really compelling. What's the, and th this might be a tough question to answer, but what's the battery life? One, if you just use right. it as a watch, and then if you use it for showing video and stuff like that. Uh, so we're getting about uh, 30 plus hours in typical usage scenario. So you charge it every night like your cell phone. Okay. Uh, if you paired it to your mobile phone, we're getting a little bit less, although we're about to push out our 1.0.3 software upgrade, which gives up to 50% enhancement in battery life when you're using it with a Bluetooth phone. Uh, we've done a lot of optimization around that. I mean, we, we have a 230 milliamp hour battery in here, and we should take one of these apart for you and show you, but it is tiny. And so we spent a tremendous amount of time optimizing the power. Um, to make sure that you can really go all day and not have to worry about it. Where I'm going with that is I bet if you need to talk to Wi-Fi, uh, if you're right. going to try to show a new tweet on the watch every second, right. it probably would kill the battery pretty quickly, so, right? So that's why we have this sort of dual mode uh, ability of, for connecting. So yeah. pushing things like that are great to do over Bluetooth because it's fairly low power. Um, but what we actually do is, is have a sync model where every hour you wake up and you do connect via Wi-Fi or you're tethered to your phone or however you get out to the cloud and bring down bigger chunks of data. So let's get the weather updates, let's get your calendar updates, things at that time. But there is the ability, 
running our smartphone apps on your on your Android phone to push stuff over to give you alerts that way. We do a little bit of that as well. What what kind of sensors are, do you have any sensors on there? Like we have accelerometer, magnetometer. Okay. Um, and so we're able to you know sense motion, and we have a pedometer app now that we're uh, about to bring out that starts to help with some of the fitness aspects of what we do. Yeah, that's why I was asking, because yeah. the Jawbone Up got really popular, and that, all it did is a pedometer. It doesn't have a right. screen. It doesn't do Wi-Fi. It doesn't exactly. do anything else. Right? It's interesting. It, it, you know, it's, uh, They've had some problems with that product, but in yeah. general, there's there's some interesting things you can do in that space, and it sort of made me realize that products like that are essentially features that can be embedded into a platform. So when you design a platform like we did, it's Android-based, and third parties can create applications, we can track your sleep. We can vibrate every you know, 20 or 30 minutes to remind you to get up and stretch and move a little bit during the day. Um, all that can be done, but then it also does everything else you want to have happen on the device. So. Is this water resistant? Or? It is. Um, Gets team spent a lot of time working on water resistance. Uh, but we, we wanted to make sure that when you wash your hands, when you give your kid a bath at night, when you're doing the dishes, you're not going to ruin this thing. Uh, and so we've passed the ISO standards for water resistance for watches. It's not for diving, though. It's not a diving standard. No. Not today. Not, not today. today. We're not working today. on some yeah. stuff around. I'd like that. to build one that's uh, <laughs> that's diveable. Yeah, that'd yeah. be great. To, uh, because I, as a wearable, mm -hmm. I, I bet developers are, at, are wondering, can you look at altitude or mileage traversed or anything like that? Do you have any GPS or any ability to... Use it for like a skiing kind of computer? So we have a couple a things. Kind of we have a GPS radio in there. We're um, continuing to tweak the software to get good time to first fix, so we haven't released it to third parties to start building apps on yet. Yeah. Um, but it is in there. Uh, we don't have a pure altimeter because of the water resistance. Mm -hmm. to, to seal this thing up uh, and yeah. keep water out, you've actually made it airtight so that you can't read the pressure of the air. So uh, over time, we can use GPS for altitude. Yeah. I'm just wondering what what kinds of things developers would do. What how uh, what else, what other kinds of APIs do you have that are in the in the uh, platform for developers to build these little micro apps? Well, essentially, they're Android apps, and so we use the Android tools. Uh, you know, if you're used to using Eclipse or whatever to build your Android apps, you build in there. There's something called an add-on um, that takes care of things like our screen size and our sync model, where you can queue up requests for next sync. But otherwise. It's what you get in Android. I mean, obviously, we don't have cellular telephony. We don't have a camera. We're actually a lot like what's in a tablet in terms of hardware, just shrunken down quite a bit. Yeah. What about uh, microphone? Yeah. Microphone is not in the current generation. It comes up a lot, um, and it's something we're actively investigating and working on. Um, you know, really for command and control kinds of things. It's yeah. a couple people ask about like, can it be a headset or can it ultimately be my phone? Most people aren't interested in that, right? They love their smartphone. We're not trying to replace that. Um, you know, talking into your watch is, is probably even worse than wearing a Bluetooth headset around all day long. Yeah, so I mean, voice commands would be real handy. You know, yes, uh, absolutely. So for command and control, I think that's that's really what we're going to focus on. Interesting. Um, I saw the. I think you were showing me mm -hmm. uh, video mm -hmm. from a ca camera over Wi-Fi, right? Yeah. So can it, it, it can actually br receive video from things or. It sure can. Um, I mean, it, it depends on what you want to be looking at. So, as Tim said, for command and control, it certainly makes sense. But I'm not going to sit there and watch and queue up videos on my on my whim. <laughs> right. One but like like GoPro and Contour, all the, and these sports cameras now mm -hmm. are Wi-Fi enabled and have Wi-Fi uh, uh, video camera capabilities. Mm -hmm. So a skier might not want to pull. You know, want, might want to have one of these things on his helmet and right. want to be able to watch what the video looks like on his, his right. watch. Right, or make sure like it's pointing in the right direction, start, stop, pause, so you're not headed, um, you know, uh, 10 feet down the hill before you can make sure that you've got it started before the action, you know, ends or um, starts. So yeah. you're not wasting footage and you're able to control the camera a lot better than if you were to have to reach up onto your helmet every time. Um, so the display is a full color LCD display. And some people were asking, why should I buy this instead of buying an iPod Nano? Uh, yeah, yeah an so iPod Nano and putting it on a watch band. That's um, one of the other differences I think you'll see with ours. This is always on, and it's a um, bimodal transflective screen, so you can see it. Um, in bright sunlight as well as in low light. And one of the differences here also is there are no but buttons to push. So um, you get the time or, um, for instance, this one's pulling my calendar invite um, 
and there's the weather. So our developers have the opportunity to develop applications not only in the carousel, but also that push information through the watch face. So it truly is more glanceable without the push of a button. It's always on the screen. And when you say it's um, bimodal, so yes, it does spin up a full color screen, which you can swipe right into the app carousel. Yeah, it's pretty intuitive to use. I didn't have to read any manuals to set it or anything. I, yep. I figured out, oh, you touch it like an iPhone, you know, mm -hmm. and it does. Yeah, get up down, right? Uh, yep. right, right. Um, where do you think this is going? I, and you know, now that you have a platform, are you? You mm -hmm. said you're more than watches, right? Where, where well, do you think you this know, is going to be used? So, so one of the reasons that we invested, in, and you mentioned some of the other devices that are emerging right now, and, and we, we like to think there's a category that's emerging in 2012 and will extend into 2013, and, and hopefully we'll continue to see quite a bit of traction. The most obvious place for this is a digital companion tied to the phone. Yeah. We clearly want to be a great companion to the phone by blending applications that are perhaps of our own creation or of our developers along with the phones, the devices themselves, and expanding that interaction, we think there could be a great, you know, synergy between these two devices. Going beyond that, we've had we've been approached by a lot of really interesting companies in a lot of different vertical markets. There's General Fitness, you mentioned uh, Fitbit and other companies like that yeah. that are doing that are really. Tim referred to them really as features. There's there's companies that are very interested in having this slightly more powerful computing device that they can then go build upon. There's performance athletics. The performance athletic guys today continue to push the limits of real-time feedback. Yeah. We've had great conversations with companies in Japan and here domestically that are doing heart rate monitors and other types of sensing things that looked at this as a way to say, hey, wait, we've got the sensor piece, you've got the intelligence piece and the radios and all the other features and functions. If we blend these together, we get a better solution you know, faster. Neither one of us has to do both pieces of that equation. So in that context, there's there's, we call it public, and there's education, and there's vertical markets that include uh, health and fitness and athletics, and it's everything from the companies themselves to companies who make equipment. The, the people who are producing equipment in gyms today would really like to figure out how they can do two things, give you real-time feedback as somebody who's training to make sure you're not training too little or too much and hurting yourself. At the same time, they want to be able to create their own services that allows you to provide, serve you up information after the fact uh, not dissimilar to the Moto Active is a good example, who, who really wants you to record it, store it, come back, come to their site, manage your information. So yeah. we're in kind of a really unique spot, and we put a lot of, of engineering effort and time into creating something that was full-featured enough, versatile enough, that we could actually go license it to a variety of different markets. And, and so in some respects, the future of this is within our own control and domain. And some of it really is based on having these partnerships and these affiliations as a licensing company and really enabling, enabling others to go do that. Yeah. One of my favorite new iPhone apps is Highlight, and it shows mm -hmm. you when uh, another Highlight user walks within 50 yards yes. of you. Is that something that the watch can do? Can I can it sense that my watch is close to another WIM user, and can it do something? Can it blink or yeah, so pass data back and forth? It's interesting. We don't we haven't enabled that yet, uh, right. but there's some really interesting things you can do over Bluetooth, especially when you control all the radios in the right. ecosystem, right? Um, where you can automatically pair, make people aware of e of each other because they have the same device. So I think you'll see some of that stuff coming out, and that might be tied to some of our licensees and their <coughs> particular vertical interests, as Gift said. You know, we talked to these companies, and one of the reasons we built a platform is that as a startup, there, there's so many opportunities in front of you, and uh, to just pick one is difficult. And also, to have a sort of enter all these different markets, you know, performance sports and health monitoring, fitness and cell phone companions is, is impossible. Um, yes. So we go after these different verticals, and they will be bringing things to market. And some might be targeted more at, at social, some might be targeted more at fitness, some might be targeted more at, at sort of gadget geek. So. Yeah. How much memory is in this watch, and and will that vary from de device to device? Um, uh, it it <coughs> excuse me. There's there's five twelve flash. There's uh, two fifty six uh, mobile DDR, and there's two gigabytes of storage. However, we have a micro SD card embedded in it. So you can configure it up to maximum memory density today 32. of 32 gigabytes. Wow. So you could load this up with a ton of information. Um, we didn't build the initial ones with that much storage and memory because fundamentally, the other thing we think is really important is as, as connectivity increases and improves, and we see Wi-Fi going in a variety of different directions, right? It was predicted to be ubiquitous long ago, but we haven't quite hit that yet, but it's coming. Um, 
the information that we're managing and we're living with in our lives today continues to grow exponentially. Uh, I'm sure you know quite a bit about that. Yep. So our thought is, and, and thinking from the very, very early phases this was, we'll put the capability there. So if somebody wants to load it up and serve music or other types of content, the information's there. However, the idea that there is a small glassable screen that's talking to the cloud and is pulling information and is reaching out is, is you know, it's been illustrated to us by not only our thoughts and thinking but others that there is a place here where touching the cloud and having small experiences is the next phase when you think about computing. So we understand laptops, we understand pads, we understand smartphones. As you go down this migration of smaller and smaller interactions and display devices, there's going to be something else. It's not, we're not going to stop innovating, we're not going to stop moving down this path of evolution as you start to consume information and data. And we think that next step, that call it the fifth screen if you like, which really if it's on your arm is kind of the first screen, um, we think there's a place here. And that's why we targeted being in that spot there. Yeah. Why hasn't Apple done this? It, it, it makes sense. They have uh, this store network now around the world. The, selling small things would be really cool for them to increase their sales. Uh, why haven't they uh, thought of... We, we hear rumors that they're doing a TV, right? But we haven't heard yeah. rumors that they're doing a watch. Yeah, right? I'm we sure we all have those rumors. <laughs> we've heard some, yeah, we've heard a bunch of those rumors. I, I think that uh, there has to be a place. There's been a few uh, pundits write about Google and Apple paying attention to this space. And, and quite honestly, I would be very surprised if they don't. Uh, they are extraordinarily good at doing things that add a very clear value. They're very simple. The brilliance of, of iPod really was that it was simple. It was extraordinarily simple, and they do that very, very well. So why haven't they done it to date? I think they've been kind of busy. Um, if you look at the explosive growth of the iPad and yeah. the, the application ecosystem and the phone and how quickly it's moved and grown, I, I think there, there quite honestly, uh, will be um, a time where they have the energy to go do this. But I, you know, uh, John Rubenstein and the guys that were there in the early 2000s who really helped to put the blocks that are in place that are today said it very clearly. They're not going to do it until they can do it right. Yeah. And um, they'll watch markets emerge and they'll watch them grow. And, you know, who, who knows? We'll see if they So you're cutting, you're cutting the path through the uh, brush and then, then they'll either buy you or uh, clone you or... <laughs> or, or, or we stay in the market as the Android alternative, right? I mean, right. now more right. Android phones are shipping than iPhones, right? Yeah. And so there's clearly a demand for that. You bet. Uh, Mm -hmm. um, you guys are only supporting Android right now, right? Is that mostly well, because Apple's rules on APIs? Let's be clear. So we build the device on Android as the OS, but we Got talk it. to any cell phone out there. So we'll bring you caller ID, um, things like that. We do do a little more on BlackBerry and Android because those OSs are slightly more open. Yeah. And as Apple, I think, continues to open up what they allow people to do over Bluetooth, we'll be right there. Yeah. So. It's interesting. I didn't know that you built the OS on Android. You didn't. Yeah. You didn't start over and come up with a new OS for no. I mean, small, it, it, we could leverage the developer community, as I was talking earlier, the tools. Um, and it, it was just a really compelling proposition, especially for a startup, not to have to sort of reinvent the wheel there. Yeah. Um, what else do we need to know about this thing? Uh, what's the screen resolution? How many pixels are in there? It's uh, 160 DPI, and it's one inch, so it's 160 by 160. Yeah. And um, Let's see. You know, we talked about the water resistance and uh, what kind radios. of processor? How fast is it? It's got an ARM 11 processor that's uh, dynamically frequency scaling, but goes up to almost 700 megahertz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's a very, very powerful uh, small computer. And what's the most advanced <laughs> app that you put on it? That, that taxes that processor? Well, we have not put it on, but you can find videos on the web of uh, someone who's hacked our device and run Angry Birds on it. It looks great. It runs very well. Angry Birds is everywhere. It's a little bit of a small screen, but I think there's some interesting opportunities. A little hard to shoot those birds. Yeah, in the gaming space. But I mean, that, that's a pretty graphically intensive game, and the physics engines that are involved in that uh, all run seamlessly. What was the video you um, saw yesterday? So, it didn't have oh, there was, a, with, uh, there was a really interesting video where uh, someone hooked up their their Microsoft Connect uh, and used the infrared camera capabilities and streamed it to their WIM module. So it became sort of this night vision spy cam. <laughs> it's very interesting. So, very cool. Yeah. Clever. Um, 
they don't yet talk to each other, right? So I couldn't get 10 of them and lay them out in, in an array and not, do something. Not right now. We're really looking, uh, well, two things. One is with our next software release after the 103 that I just mentioned, we're going to be adding a whole host of additional Bluetooth profiles that will allow us to connect to things beyond cell phones and ultimately to other WIM modules. But uh, hid controls so you can actually control your PowerPoint presentation. Uh, AVRCP so that you can control a music player on your phone, for example. A2DP to get stereo audio out of the device directly. Um, and as part of that Bluetooth enhancement, I think we'll be working on some things that allow these things to talk to it's each other. Peer to peer communication. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. um, how are you guys funded? Tell me some of the fundamentals of the business and how are you guys are building and so, are you hiring? And uh, are we hiring? <laughs> well, we're always, always looking for great talent, right? And that has to be the only, the only answer uh, to that question. Uh, we were, uh, it was publicly announced we were funded by a private corporation, a large corporation uh, in Asia um, called Foxconn. They made an investment yep. in the company. So they've been a great partner to us from an investment standpoint. They're the guys who build the iPhone. They things. do, they do. We've got Among some, other things. you bet, <laughs> you've got some great friends there and, and we talked to them a couple of years ago based on our past relationships and they were um, uh, interested in what we were doing and thought there, there really was something here that could evolve into a new category. So that and uh, another small venture fund that's affiliated with our CEO and founder. So it's been pretty tight, yep. pretty close. Very cool. Yeah. Anything else I need to know about what you guys are doing? Or no, I, did you see the App Store? Uh, We've got a beta yeah. of it. This is, this is early, but starting the third party yeah. stuff is starting to flow in. Um, and this is hopefully at the end of the month to launch, but Lori can take one that. Yeah, so um, the idea is that we've been working with developers since November, and we've been engaging them on our forum. So Tim mentioned we have over 3,300 or so developers. And I, I think some of the challenges for them is not just porting over their standard Android apps. We've been working with them to distill the experience just yeah. so it works with uh, uh, my, you know, just a bit of information pushed through the screen. And so we've collected a handful of apps across health, fitness, entertainment, lifestyle, productivity, yeah. using some of the sensors, like for instance, the Labyrinth game. So I see a few here that get get me to think about other things. Coffee card. Is it is this a way that we're going to pay for things in the future? We do today. Yeah. Actually, the the local baristas are a little freaked out when we all walk in and, and pay with our watches, but it works perfectly. It just <laughs> generates the barcode on the screen. You can scan it. Very cool. Yeah. And the golf score. So you can build all sorts of productivity apps to capture information right. about what you're doing. Or you simple bet. tip calculators. You can split the bill between your friends and exclude alcohol. Um, <laughs> so we had that one, for instance, installed for CES. Um, <laughs> But how, yes. how many can you load up as many of these apps as you want until your memory's full? Or yeah, yeah, so. you can. I mean, I think similar to your smartphone, you're only going to use a handful of them. Um, you can manipulate the carousel through the owner site, um, so you have access to the ones you use most frequently um, right up front. But with the new software release, we've also updated some of the UI and navigation, so you can quick advance through the carousel and get to the apps a lot quicker. You don't, do you tell uh, the users sort of the battery implications of any of these apps? I mean, if you some app, some apps we, I could see yeah. can you really use the uh, battery and some... We, we don't out. today. We've got a certification program. And what we're doing is uh, testing all the apps before they go into the store to make sure they play nice. What we'll be launching probably in another month or two is a special section of the App Store, which is a little bit of a labs section. There's a downloader beware kind of thing. You know, this might screw with your battery or it might... Uh, not follow all our UI guidelines, but we think it's compelling enough to sort of get people excited and thinking about the platform in new ways that will make it available. Yeah, so. cool stuff. What? Why do you guys call yourselves Wim Labs? Where did that name come from? I'm gonna let you ask that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, it's actually gone through a few incarnations, but wearable imagination is what we say our first name. Wearable to. imagination. Very yeah. cool. And where do we find more information about you? Well, Wim.com, uh, and then the developer kits are available on Amazon.com. Cool. WIMM dot com. Yep. Yep. Very cool. Thank you so much for showing me this. Thank stuff. you. And thanks for watching. Thanks. thanks for yeah. coming to see. <laughs>
where open source has worked into the project and where we would like to, you know, we really should contribute back open source stuff. So first of all, I'm gonna talk about graphics. I'm gonna talk about daylighting design. So I'm not an architect, but I'm a wannabe architect, like buildings and making buildings better by incorporating daylighting in a good way. Um, so I'll talk about that. And then this thing called spatially augmented reality, which is augmented reality, but spatial or something like that. And MPAC comes in too, so it's you know, a lot of stuff, and I will try to talk 20 minutes or so? Okay. Um, so, what's daylighting design? It's trying to make good use of daylighting in your buildings so that you can reduce the amount of electric light you're using and just make them more pleasant places to be. I really like this room because it's got nice windows in it, and it's providing good ambient light, and you can even look at the projector screen. So I'd say this is a pretty good room for daylighting. Uh, this is another classroom uh, on campus. My living room I like too, but there's an unfortunate problem when I sit down on my couch around 6 p.m. at night, the sun happens to squeak through the blinds in such a way when I'm sitting on my screen I can't look at my laptop. And so uh, one of the things we'd like to do with architectural daylighting design is help people understand where this glare situation is gonna come in, where there's a really bright thing in your field of view and you're trying to focus on your screen. So there's some challenges and it's of course complicated and expensive and that's why we need some tools for it. So we've got this Instead of just having a computer application, we built this tangible interface is the buzzword. Um, a tangible interface uh, where multiple people can gather to look at stuff. So in this case, I've got multiple students pretending to be architects standing around a desk or a table. They're going to build a small mock-up of a design that they're considering, including placing windows and specifying which direction is north. Uh, there's a camera that detects what they've built and their projectors that will give a visualization of the simulation of daylighting. So I'll show a video. Oh, not yet. Uh, just a little bit more about the tangible interface. So again, there's a, a collection of cardboard modules off to the side on a table. You can pull out whichever ones you want. Might not be exactly the right length, but that's okay. You can build kind of a sloppy design. Um, the little paper slips that slip over the top edges, that specifies that there's a window on the side. And they're on the top edge just because that's maybe a single camera looking at them. But of course, there's different, different ways you can specify this. Camera detects the stuff it sees, and we end up with the 3D model after some work. And this 3D model is then what we do our simulation on. All right, and so now I'll just show a video of the design process. So again, you sloppily build some stuff. It's okay if you don't have the long enough walls. You just leave some gaps. Um, uh, put some markers on the table to specify what color the walls are and specify a north arrow. And then after a short wait, this is what that place is going to look like at noon on a particular day of the year. And then you can also play an animation because these are projectors and it's good out Designing a nice user interface that makes this as easy for people to use, um, maybe people who aren't specifically skilled with all the CAD modeling tools and everything. And then of course, if you don't like something about it, if you realize there's gonna be glare, you could shuffle the walls around, you know, the color of the walls, change things about it, and again, get another simulation of a time-lapse animation. And this is you know, something you could walk around and actually see um, on the table. Okay, so we took this small-scale thing, actually this was always just the test bed platform. The goal was to take this to full scale because, of course, wouldn't you love to stand in the model that you're proposing to build? So we went down to MPAC. How many people have been to MPAC? <laughs> Everyone should go. There's a lot of stuff there. A lot of really nice spaces. Um, stuff happening all the time. Some artsy, some techy, some mix. Uh, anyways, we went down there. We, we um, are not carpenters, but we built some walls that are eight feet tall. We put them on wheels. <laughs> covered them with white material, either plywood or canvas, um, and you can shove them around. And we have a system to allow us to track where those walls are, again, using a camera. In this case, instead of using color-coded little slips of paper and stuff, um, in this full-scale system, we actually use uh, IR LEDs. So those little black circles that actually have an LED in the middle of them. And this allows us to track. It um, doesn't get confused by the projector. So some technical reasons why we, we like this system for the uh, full-scale. Um, OK, so this is the full-scale system. Uh, just to give you a, a preview of what we can do, you can start with all white surfaces in the upper left. Uh, infrared camera images sees where those LEDs are, and we've uniquely placed those LEDs on the wall so we can keep track of, uh, uniquely identify which wall is where. Um, this is output from our tracking visualization. And then on the right, I can paint the walls virtually um, by telling which projectors, which pixels should be which color to, again, consistently color these things. And just to show you that it, it works dynamic situations as well as these walls are moving around. We've got six people out there shoving six walls around. Um, in just a second, we will turn on the projectors and turn off the lights. And it's 
still kind of see it on the screen, but the walls are staying consistently colored even as they're moving. Of course, um, there's a little bit of wiggle because the walls aren't constructed perfectly. Uh, but uh, when they stop, they, they get they get calibrated pretty well. And just to show you that I can color walls, but that's not the only thing we can do. Uh, the next thing we did, we really wanted to challenge ourselves building a five-piece jigsaw puzzle. So we took a panorama actually from Professor Stewart's uh, research. Uh, so it's just a long panorama image. We chopped it up into five pieces, assigned each chunk of texture to one of the walls in the system, we started them in some scram scrambled configuration. And then as you move the walls around, the texture stays stuck to the walls. Just a plain video here. Um, uh, texture stays stuck and no matter which orientation you place it, we figure out which projector can see that wall and we put that texture on that surface. And again, as you get two walls that are um, supposed to be adjacent, when they get close enough to each other, the pieces will snap together. It's just a simple demo. You know, Five-piece jigsaw puzzle, it took about five grad students to solve. Because uh, the walls are kind of heavy. <laughs> Again, we're not great carpenters. Uh, but, prototype uh, demonstration. Okay, uh, so that's the jigsaw puzzle. And getting on to a slightly more serious application, we can use this for volumetric visualization. For example, uh, if you have a, you know, a uh, medical data sets, you have a three-dimensional data set. We're going to take that data, embed it in the virtual environment, blow it up in this case to about eight feet tall, human head. Uh, and that, that, that data is virtually in space. And as you push the physical wall through the virtual location of that data, uh, we will figure out what cross-section of the data it's seen, tell the projector that sees that wall best to go ahead and project on that surface, and you get this visualization. And it works even if you rotate the wall around. This will allow you to explore 3D data set with a, a, a virtual wall, excuse me, a physical wall, and this works um, in large scale. Other people have done this before in small scale, but this was the first small scale. And then, of course, coming back to our original motivation for this one is can we you know, do this uh, architectural visualization to allow you to stand inside of your room and see how the daylighting is going to perform? And the idea with this little demo is if there's something you don't like about your, your current design, you want to make the room a little bit bigger, you can actually just go shove the walls. And it's not just a single person interaction. Anybody can go grab and push the walls around. That's why I really like uh, this multiple person interaction. It's not your traditional augmented reality where one person wears a head-mounted display and they get to see all this cool stuff. No, we can you know, bring as many people as we want into this space. And they all uh, have equal importance in terms of driving the simulation and pushing things around. Um, so here, taken my students and shrunk them down to be you know, about six inches tall and put them on my tabletop. And uh, this is actually, that's what I thought I was seeing when I first watched this video. Because for so long I've been watching the video of the small scale system that when I saw this I'm like, oh my gosh, my students, they're very small now. Um, but they can walk around and again see where the light is moving in their space. And the claim for this is uh, an architect could bring the clients in. Sometimes a client might have a hard time understanding either a drawing or a uh, even a, a, a computer simulation if you're just looking at it on a flat screen. Uh, but actually to bring them into the space, they'll understand the spatial relationships in the room a little bit more, actually start to understand how daily lighting is going to move around in space and, and uh, maybe make better decisions uh, for their designs. And then, of course, since this is RPI and we have a games major and a bunch of the students I work with are dual CS, GSAS majors, um, it wasn't surprising that they figured out how to make a game out of this as well. Pretty cool. I left one day. Daylighting was working. I was happy. The next day, I come in and playing pong. If I had sound on this, you would hear the wheels grinding <laughs> as they shove the walls across the floor. Fortunately, I think we only had a stubbed toe, no major injuries. So, not a bit good. All right. Uh, coming back to the more technical part of this stuff, um, we have a complex projection environment. So this isn't just a dark room with a single flat screen. We actually have multiple surfaces that we're projecting on. And we have to be concerned about um, scattering between those surfaces. So this is just a simple uh, uh, simulation to show you. Say we had a room that was all white. It's a little L-shaped box room with a table, some simple geometry. And it's all white, no lights. Uh, this is just what it looks like uh, on the left. But we want to uh, simulate what the space would look like if we colored some of the walls and installed some area lights on the ceiling. So the middle is our desired appearance. We want to allow people to walk into the space and experience the, the, uh, what it would look like if we made these changes to the room. So if we naively take the textures in that middle image 
and use projectors to project them on surfaces, we're going to end up with a thing over there on the right. What the heck happened? You know, we projected the right answer, what we wanted, on those surfaces, and we get this totally washed out thing. Actually, it looks even more washed out than this projector, uh, but everything is very pastel. You don't see the vivid colors, and it's just, in general, too bright. And certainly, if I just turned down the brightness, it would solve the problem partially, but it would still be really washed out. Uh, so what's happening? Well, when you project uh, white light on the floor, it's not just going on the floor, it's also scattering on all the other surfaces because, again, the original room, they're white surfaces. So you don't want to project too much white on the floor because you're going to get extra white on the left wall. And you don't need to project this like pinkish tone on the left wall because you're going to get scattering from the floor, too. So how do you figure out what you should project so that your final appearance of the room is as close as possible to your desired appearance? Uh, so this is a question that's been asked before. Um, another researcher proposed something called reverse radiosity. I won't explain what radiosity is, but they figured out how to basically do the inverse calculation. And so for the desired appearance and the known material properties of the room, they can figure out what to project on those surfaces, that's that middle stuff, in order to get the ideal solution. Unfortunately, uh, the, tr the way they described reverse radiosity was just a simple inverse. Um, they got negative components for their projection negative values of light. And I know you guys are amazingly smart, but I don't think you can invent a projector that emits negative light, right? Kind of impossible in the physical world. Uh, but if you go and you dig out and look at their solution for this particular example and for many other examples, they have negative components of light. And if we look, this is the negative, like basically it's saying we want to suck uh, green and blue light <coughs> off of the left wall to make it look red. That's how they're making the left wall look red, by removing green and red light because there's a lot of white scattering around in the room and RGB. So this is what you should project as negative light. Then you get the exact solution. But of course, um, what you're probably going to do when you get this solution vector back again is just chuck the negative components, zero them out, only project the positive quantities, which in this case is pretty much just the light sources on the ceiling, and that's what you get on the, on the right. So it's kind of a surprising and disappointing result for, for their method. So we went back and we looked at it and we said, well, clearly what we need to do is do an optimization here, a non-negative least squares optimization of this color space. Um, and so our solution is in the upper right. Our, well, excuse me, our solution is what we decide to project in the middle, which is kind of what you'd do if you did by hand. If you want to make it look as much as possible like this, you'd project saturated red light on the left wall and use the indirect scattering that's going to happen naturally, and you'll get pretty close to the, the answer. So this is the optimal solution in the top middle and our result, which you can see isn't an exact match to the desired appearance, because this is, too, this is a hard problem but it's uh, the optimal solution uh, to get as close as possible. So, work we did. Um, oh, there's math. Does anyone want to talk about math? <laughs> it's summer, right? Oh, you don't count. <laughs> uh, there's math. Um, and here are some, uh, some of our results on our, our physical environment. Again, the desired scene. This is a top row is all simulated images, but the bottom row, these are all photographs of our table. So if you just naively grab the desired imagery, project it on the walls, and get this washed out thing happening. Um, reverse radiosity, the previous work. Um, actually, if you look at this left wall, we've lost the window. And actually, the, our rendering of windows is a little not intuitive. They're black squares. Um, but ignoring that strange UI choice, um, you can't see the window at all here because, again, this uh, reverse radiosity is relying on negative light to get that color um, in their solution. And then, actually, the two on the right are both our work. Um, one is optimizing in a linear color space. And if you know about human perception, Actually, we see color in non-uniform, um, uh, and so this is a non-linear uh, color space. It's harder, much more expensive to do the calculation, but you get a better result. And that's all detail to talk about later. Um, this is just highlighting again a recent paper we had. Um, again, not to belabor too much the implementation, but uh, especially for that non-linear optimization, there was a lot of stuff. Yusheng, if anyone knows Yusheng, amazing PhD student put all these things together, made it happen very fast. Uh, the simulation would take 30 minutes in MATLAB for his first draft, and he got it done to you know one or two frames a second using GPU, so it was pretty amazing. But all this stuff happened, and, and just to, to say, uh, you know, open source stuff is great, he was able to pull this off by taking a lot of work from other people and bringing it together, and there's a lot of um, code sharing on GPU stuff, and, and it's just great. And I think some of these were, perhaps, at least one of these was something we had to buy, but for the most part, we're, we're making heavy use of open source stuff and putting this together. Um, and I'll talk about that again in a sec. How are we doing? Okay. Uh, 
All right, uh, next up, is anyone know Andrew Dolchek? He just graduated last year in the co-turn program. And so we had this daylighting system and we played Pong. Actually, that was Andrew pulling this off. And then for his master's thesis, he took his daylighting system and said, yeah, architecture, I don't care about that. I like playing video games. Um, can we make a video game using a lot of the infrastructure on the, on the tabletop? And so he made a little war game uh, with interesting terrain and walls that were obstacles and then little army men painted in two different colors and you place them on the map and if they're close enough to each other and they have a clear line of sight then they can go into combat and can we help enforce the rules using the computer and make it a nice elegant um, interface so that you know non-experts with computer interfaces could still have fun playing this game. So here's the tabletop with no um, projection on it. Again that's the raw terrain top and then you can augment it by putting say textures on the sides of the walls, um, uh, make it look like buildings and things like that. So this is just just to help the ambiance in the, in the space, putting some texture on the surfaces. And then this is a visualization of what it might look like during gameplay. So this is the red person's turn. The X's are where the character started the turn and these circles are saying where you can move each one of these players. And so if you're familiar with these little tabletop memes, there's a rule each turn you can move a certain distance across the field. Um, the computer will help you verify that you've done legal moves, and so you can't cheat and move a person too far. The computer will check on that. Yeah? Just a quick question. How many projectors are producing that image in two? Or uh, actually, this is six. We've six. done four, six, and ten. <laughs> when we, we had ten going and unpacked once, and that was a bit of a... So yeah, there's six, and they might not be perfectly aligned, and there's some shadows and things going on, and those are all small details. Um, so here's another visualization of, you know, now this is the green person's turn. Um, again, where the people currently are, uh, their movement, their legal movement circles, and then the yellow line, they're visualizing who they have a line of sight to and could compete with in the next combat round, which is coming up soon. So again, this helps you plan where to move your characters, helps you see, you know, where you might have walked yourself, you know, just so you can understand uh, how the gameplay is going and the plan for you. So this is a neat little game you put together. and. Um, using, again, all the infrastructure we've had for the previous system. So overall, applications of this sort of spatially augmented reality uh, work, education and training, collaborative design environments, uh, data exploration and discovery, and, of course, entertainment. Uh, one of my top priorities, but it's seeming to sneak in there with the games. Um, I'll just briefly talk about the next thing we're doing, adding to this system which is the, the laser pointer interaction. So a lot of times in our interfaces, we wanted some other way to communicate with the system. It's almost been like, yeah, if I had a pointer, I would draw where I wanted the window on the wall. I'm standing in the space, you know, can't I just point? And people have done some of this work already, gesture recognition when you're standing in these spaces. And so we started playing around with the laser uh, pointer for this. And also for the game, it might be nice, hey, tell me more data about this particular person. You can point or circle that person, that would be helpful. And so we started work on this, um, initially just on a single surface, and uh, uh, we had multiple lasers, actually. We're doing multiple person collaboration, one of the little simple demos. We moved up from our five-piece jigsaw puzzle and we've done larger versions. Uh, this one, I think we had 12 people working on a 10 by 10 jigsaw puzzle, and they solved it. I don't have a timer running, so I can't say what it was. But um, it's a nice, you know, there's not just one mouse connected to the computer anymore. Essentially, there's 12 mice, and, or we you know, scaled more, we had more lasers, uh, but can move around the pieces and solve puzzles. And we had another one for showing uh, data visualization. We just put a giant graph of, in this case, the mammals, actually the whole animal kingdom. And a couple simple interactions. If you circle the node, it would expand it and show you all the things underneath it. You could grab on a node and rearrange it if you didn't like how it was currently laid out. And then you could also scribble on something to say, collapse this node and decrease what's going on. So just simple graph interaction, and again, in this multi-person. Okay, so to talk about open source. So we put together this huge system. We couldn't have done it on our own, writing everything from scratch. So off the top of my head, these are the things I remember that we use. There's probably more stuff. If I talk to the students, you probably get a longer list here. Uh, but open source stuff we have used. Um, AR toolkits, anyone heard of that? Um, these are some pictures from that. It allows you, it's a system you can build, uh, print out these little um, barcode markers. And again, this is a Typical augmented reality, often used in an augmented reality sense, where you're, one person is wearing a head-mounted display, the camera sees these barcode markers in the scene, and then adds virtual stuff into your field of view. So in this case, adding a little person on the top that the person holding the card with the barcode marker can see. Uh, 
before, you know, putting a little person on your desk and with video conferencing. Uh, we ended up not using this system at all because in our environment, it would have been really awkward to put these relatively large barcode tags on all of our walls and stuff. So we ended up not using it, but it was inspirational. Um, yeah, it's there. Um, camera projector calibration. This is a giant nightmare for people who do computer vision work. And I'm a graphics person. I didn't want to do computer vision. Um, not that it's just hard to see. It's a lot to do stuff. So it was great. We were able to grab a lot of people's um, open source code to do various pieces of the calibration. There was one thing that was a Windows executable, and it was a real nuisance. It didn't really work perfectly. Um, but again, if we had to write that from scratch, we would not have even gotten past step one here. Uh, CGAL is a great computational geometry license, or excuse me, algorithms library or something it stands for. Uh, the license is a little bit intimidating. It's one of these open source unfortunate things where too many people's licenses got com combined and uh, it's kind of scary when you read through it. We're not necessarily intimidated by it, but you basically can't commercialize anything when you use this, uh, which is not surprising with open source, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we used a whole bunch of other open source stuff and this is so again, we couldn't have pulled this off without open source. Um, things we could, should, will open source, and this is where I have to apologize, we haven't done it yet. Um, I think, oh, I'll put my excuses later, but the pieces that I think will be helpful to, to put out there and share uh, would be our calibration infrastructure. Again, we use a lot of other people's pieces, but how we put it together might be helpful for someone else who's putting together a, a spatially augmented reality system. So here are just some of the pieces again. In order to get full calibration in MPAC, we did all kinds of crazy things, putting markers on the floor, um, devices that were put all over the place. And this is again to get the projectors and cameras in alignment. Uh, to track our physical objects, so we actually had two systems. One is the small scale uh, using color, and the second one is the larger scale and MPAC using LEDs. And so there's some, some algorithm stuff there we've described in papers, but it would be nice to share the source code uh, for that as well. Uh, are specifically for architecture to help interpret what people build, either on the table or in uh, full scale. Uh, these are the modules that we've seen laid out in the table. If we ask the artist who, who laid them on the table, this is the space they wanted to convey, how do we automatically create the image on the right, which is determining inside versus outside? For just four walls made into a square, it's really easy. For something more complicated like this, it took some work to get that, that answer over there, right? And there's certainly cases where what people build is quite big. Uh, but that would be code we can share. Um, we have a program that we call the Remesher that does everything in the kitchen sink related to triangle models. Uh, I don't know how useful this would be outside because it does have a lot of overlap with the Seagal library. Um, but again, it's something that could be shared. And then um, the projector calibration or compensation, which I talked about. Uh, again, we've published all of the, the algorithms, but it would be nice to share the source code, especially since it's this big mix of GPU code and everything coming together. Um, and the laser tracking stuff, which we're still currently working on, could be nice to share as well. So, now this is my excuse slide. Why haven't we done this yet? Number one thing is time. Uh, have to balance needing to do research, students who need to graduate, uh, with development. This is producing functional, stable code. So there's a big difference between making it work for an example to publish a paper and putting it out there in a form that other people could use it. Um, another one is pride. We need to get over this, I guess. Don't want to release poorly written or broken code. Yeah. I don't know what the solution is then. You know, David kind of mentioned this as well. You know, if we put it out there, we don't want to maintain it, right? Uh, we don't want people sending us email that's broken, like, yeah, we know it's broken. It works for some examples. Um, and then the big thing, too, is usefulness. Some modules are too specific to our application and setup. And I'd almost feel like we want to you know, rip out the pieces that are specific and get it down to the core that actually might be useful to someone. And again, this comes back to the time point. How do you pull out the piece and isolate the module that is really useful and you want people to, to share from something specific to make the examples work? You know, Because we're doing architecture, maybe someone wants you know, the general game infrastructure. Now that we've taken the architecture and programming, he's made the video game thing for it, maybe we figured out what the important components are. But again, separating that just takes time. So that's why we haven't done it yet. And I guess I'm done. So these are the students who've worked with me on the project. I want to thank them and, of course, funding people and them back. And thank Morthy for inviting me and all of you for listening. The last question is a question of usefulness. So I, I just want to tell you why I, the students and I developed a software some 17 years or 15 years ago. And we put the software more open source and public, public domain at that time. We didn't worry about 
And he, uh, a couple of days ago, I got a telephone call from University of Connecticut Health Center saying that they want to use the system. Can, can they use it? Please tell me it is public domain. So I contacted the student and it was public domain. Little did I know that the software that was, I thought it was, uh, who is going to use it? Some, it is a part of a big <coughs> system. So in general, rule of thumb I said to myself is, there are other creative people that they can oh, yeah. do better than uh, what I could ever think of. So, and one place I've seen this a lot is in architecture. Go visit the people just down the way in the green building. Which way am I pointing the right yeah, way? This is, this is green. green building. Yeah, that's green building. Um, they get tools and they use them in ways that we weren't expecting people to use them at all. They do crazy things with them, and it's almost like I don't want you to design a building with that. It's not certified. It's not safe. But they're just using it to in creative ways to, to you know. That's pretty cool. So we should. These are yeah. lame excuses. We should get over this. <laughs> but uh, you more important now that you have the thing. Okay, we'll just publish it. Oh, gee, she got the tenure uh, just now, so congratulations. <laughs> something to do with graphics, visualization, etc. And if something in here is interesting to you and you want to help make it open source, which, which might just be make sure it still compiles and figure out where to put it on Google code or whatever, um, maybe that's, yes. I, I'm ready to start sharing, but the hard part might be like finding it. It's all in CBS or SVN somewhere, but finding the right pieces and, and writing that minimal instruction set and like how the heck to use it if it does work. Yesterday I met somebody at MPAC who, who is uh, from Media Lab at MIT who has a joint NSF project. I forget the name of the visualization code. He is writing in Dython using Toggle and so on. Uh, Mike? Mike? Uh, Mark Downey? Mark. Uh, I forget the name of this thing. Upend. Right? Upend? I mean, you know, Upend? Yeah, uh, but there's the name of the tool. Uh, field. Yeah, field. Field, right. Who's that? Colin. Uh, oh, oh, Colin, yeah. Oh, yeah, field, right. Okay, so, yeah. so at least Colin is, uh, is an insider, so he knows the stuff. That's good. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now I'm going to go. Okay, sure, life's a race. But since when is it about coming first? It's not about her, or him, or, yeah. This is about you. You're at the starting line. See, this is your race. Let's go. Improve yourself. Challenge yourself. Nice work. Enjoy yourself. Always wanted to try that. Push yourself. Test yourself. 
free yourself. Be yourself. Well, that is crazy. Race yourself. She gets it. The Augmented Cup, by creating emotional link, improves the life of the packaging. The game offers a new experience between the brand and the consumer. This funny moment will boost the brand image and make it unavoidable. No, 55. The BNO55 it, uh, is a new sensor in a new family of application-specific sensor nodes which can calculate inside the absolute orientation from 3-axis accelerometer, a 3-axis gyroscope and a 3-axis magnetometer and the absolute orientation is given in form of quaternions or um, oil angles. What we are launching here at the Atmel booth is also the brand new Atmel wing board which has our BNO55 on board and also the new Arduino board, the new BNO55 on board. And now my colleague Divya will introduce you to our target market and applications. The BNO55 sensor, what we have in here, uh, is developed especially for target market uh, like wearables, uh, Internet of Things, indoor navigation, robotics, and for applications such as context awareness. And as we all know, there are lots of products coming every year into the market. Uh, for these specific applications, the key for success to all of our customers is getting the right product at the right time. By integrating sensors and the sensor fusion in a single device, the BNO55 eases the integration process for customers, freeing them from complexities of multi-vendor solutions. So they spend more time on product innovation. The demo we have in here with the Atmel wing board is pretty intuitive, where, you, where we use the quaternion outputs from our intelligent sensor fusion software to animate the shark. It gives an idea to our customer how they could integrate our sensor for their applications. Thanks to Atmel for inviting us here to the booth and thanks for watching.
And we're well, first of all, who are you guys? I'm Tim Twardall. And Mike Gifford. Yeah. And, and Laura Mall. Yeah. And where are we? Right. We're at Wim Labs headquarters in Logan. Hello, my name is Fabio Governale from Bosch Sensatec and I am the project leader of the BN. In 2014, South Korea is one of the most important coffee consumer country on earth. With more than 30,000 shops, each Korean adult drinks around 338 cups of coffee by year. With 50 million people, imagine how many cups are used every year. How can we improve the life of Pepka? We use the entire cup seems impossible. But what about its sleeve? We focus our reflection on new interactions between consumer and the product. For what? To increase the relationship between them and change consumer use. That's why we created an augmented reality application using the paper cup as a platform game. The coffee sleeve became a game coverage when it's scanned. 